If you've been following along with the protein synthesis lecture series and you've gotten so far, you've gotten through the worst. From now on, it's going to be a lot easier. And we've gotten to the point that the mRNA is actually done and is now going into the cytoplasm, it's leaving the nucleus, and it's going to be actually translated by the ribosomes and transfer RNA into proteins. How does that happen? Before we do that, we have to talk about transfer RNA a little bit more. Remember that the transfer RNA is that cloverleaf shaped molecule that will attach to the messenger RNA at one end and to the ribosomes at two ends with the sides and the amino acid on the top. So this uh, molecule is more than just a carrier. A lot of people that teach this talk about it as the transfer RNA just basically brings the amino acids to the ribosomes which then do the magic. I think more of it is transfer RNA is doing the magic. It's, it's transfer RNA that interprets the message from the actual messenger RNA and attaches itself to the ribosome to, which actually is going to string the, the amino acids together. But it's the transfer RNA that brings the amino acid and pairs it with the appropriate part of the messenger RNA. And we'll talk about how that actually works. So, it's actually a three-dimensional molecule that actually looks like a clover leaf that's kind of bent. So if you have the clover leaf like that, it bends forward and it crosses this three-dimensional L-shaped molecule that you see. In one side, you're going to have the attachment site, and the other side, you have the anticodon. The anticodon is actually the reverse of the codon that stands for the specific amino acid that attaches to the attachment site. So for example, if you have uh, AAG here, that's the anticodon for whatever amino acid at at attaches there. Of course, the opposite of this will be UUC. And that means that whatever amino acid stands for UUC is going to be the one that's going to be attached up, up here because of the anticodon that's attached down here. In other words, the anticodon determines the conformation of the molecule of the transfer RNA and whatever is going to be in the amino acid attachment site such that the amino acid will actually attach to the specific transfer RNA that belongs to, which means each transfer RNA is specialized in one type of amino acid. Whatever anticodon it has on the bottom is going to have a specific amino acid site to pick up the specific amino acid on the top. And that's kind of the magic of how the transfer RNA actually works. And the structure is going to be preserved, of course, by hydrogen bonds. And uh, by the way, we've been talking a lot about these hydrogen bonds between the DNA, uh, uh, base pairing rules, uh, transfer RNA, and a lot of other structures, including proteins, are maintained by hydrogen bonds. And so if you get rid of these hydrogen bonds, you get a big problem, which is why when you heat something up, and when you heat life forms up, they have problems. They denature all of these molecules, proteins and nucleic acids alike. You may be asking yourself, where does those, all of those amino acids actually come from? Well, they come through a lot of different ways. Even though it doesn't show in this picture, some amino acids can come through in a digestive form already through facilitated diffusion across the cell membrane in specific gated channels. And you also have the process of endocytosis, receptor mediated uh, endocytosis, you have pinocytosis and phagocytosis, all which bring large transporter materials into the cell. And these materials will tend to coalesce into one large vacuole-like thing which we call the endosome. And as it grows, it will become basically a multivascular body full of the remains of all the things which you've got inside the cell. Then the lysosomes will merge with that and actually start digesting that stuff. By the way, the, the lysosomes can also swallow up proteins that are inside the cell itself. So in other words, proteins which are part of the cell or endogenous proteins, not proteins that come from the outside. That's called microautophagy, when the lysosomes swallow up pieces of the cell itself. And they can also swallow large organelles in what's called macroautophagy. For example, when a mitochondria is destroyed because it's old and not doing, no longer doing its job. Or when the cell is going to auto-destruct mode and the lysosome actually lyses itself up and releases all its digestive enzymes to destroy the cell from the inside out. But what actually happens is when all of these things get together, the vesicles from the pinocytosis, the vesicles from receptor mediator endocytosis, the vesicles from phagocytosis, the macroautophagy and the microautophagy proteins 
Everything is inside this lysosome. The enzymatic proteins inside the isosome and the acidic content inside of the lysosome will actually digest those proteins into smaller chunks, which we call the amino acids. So the amino acids come from the digestive processes which happen inside the cell. There's an enzyme that's called amino acid tRNA synthetase, and there's actually 20 different versions of that enzyme, one for every kind of amino acid there is. And what this enzyme does is that it makes sure that the correct amino acid is placed at the amino acid end of the transfer RNA that has the anticodon that represents that amino acid. The way that works is that each amino acid tRNA synthetase works with one kind of amino acid. It will look around the cell until it finds it. It finds the amino acid and binds to it. It also uses an ATP to kind of charge this amino acid molecule now. Then it starts looking around to find a tRNA that actually matches that amino acid or that has the anticodon that represents the amino acid. And it actually, when it finds it, it incorporates the tRNA in its active site and then it uses the energy of the charged amino acid to actually make a connection between, or, the, or the anabolic reaction where you attach the amino acid to the receiving end of the transfer RNA and then it releases, goes back to work to do it again. And you now have an activated tRNA with the amino acid it's supposed to have in it. Then the transfer RNA that's charged with amino acid is going to go into the ribosome and find the area of the messenger RNA that actually corresponds to its anticodon. And that's the magic of protein synthesis. It's the transfer RNA that's actually doing it. When it finds an anticodon, for example in this case CGG, it will be looking through the messenger RNA until it finds the codon that corresponds to that, GCC. And then it will make that attachment through specific hydrogen bonds, and then the amino acid will be placed in the order inside the ribosome. And then the ribosome will do the rest and actually build the protein. But the interesting thing is that there are 64 possible codons, like we talked about, but only about 45 different types of transfer RNA, depending on the life form. And so that means that some transfer RNAs must be able to understand different codons. And that's a phenomenon that we actually call wobble. It was actually suggested by Quick, the same guy that came up with the, uh, the double helix molecule for the DNA structure. And he, what he figured out is that some were capable of interpreting that last base a little bit leniently. Remember, because we talked about when we did the DNA code discussion on the lecture series, that sometimes if you change the last letter, it's still the same amino acid. And some transfer RNAs have that property. So, for example, if you have something like AAA and then you have something that's AAU, the amino acid will be able to understand both as the same message. And so they will wobble, basically. It's what it's called. The same transfer RNA can connect to several different codons because those codons all represent the same amino acid that the transfer RNA is carrying. And it goes back to the redundancy of genetic code that we talked about in the previous uh, code video.